Thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral Harvey. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, Brad, for both allowing me to, to write this and for hosting this event. So I, I will try to briefly or go through some of the main arguments from the monograph and then turn it over to Brad for comments. So the, the research focus in this monograph is if a US adversary comes to believe that they can fight and win a limited nu nuclear war against the United States, is it possible that an adversary might come to that conclusion? And what is it that would make them come to or have that calculation? So if an adversary would go beyond mere threats of nuclear escalation and actually employ nuclear weapons, what are the circumstances under which they would actually do that? And how would they think about trying to control escalation once they have actually employed nuclear weapons? The goal that of both this talk and the monograph is I'm trying to lay out a framework for how we might think about this problem and US response options. And hopefully that framework and some of those conceptual ideas can be applied in detail to specific adversaries and ways that they might actually employ nuclear weapons. So as I see it, the, the 21st century challenge as it comes to this problem is that Russia, China, and North Korea are dissatisfied with the US-led international order to various degrees. And it's plausible that they may use force to try to change regional arrangements. So there are a number of scenarios that we can imagine for how one of these conflicts might happen in the future. And they are limited war scenarios. Russia may invade Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania. Its goal may be to conquer the Baltics, to secure a land bridge to Kaliningrad, or to simply demonstrate that NATO cannot defend all of its members. <coughs> China may attempt to deny Japan or the Philippines control of maritime territory in the East or South China Sea, or it may try to invade or occupy Taiwan. <coughs> North Korea has a long history of using military violence to try to achieve the outcomes that it wants. It tried to unite the Korean Peninsula by force, and in the future, it's plausible that it might again in the future. And even short of that, North Korea may try to use limited, uh, uh, limited military violence to have a campaign to do something like challenging the northern limit line. Because these are limited war scenarios, each side, in this case the aggressor, whether it's Russia, China, or North Korea, and, and the defender, which is the US and its allies, will attempt to maximize their, the benefits that they get from the outcome of the conflict while limiting the, the costs. And because of that, because these are limited conflicts where both sides are trying to keep the costs low while still maximizing their benefits, there's going to be competitions among both sides about the types and the level of violence that's occurring. Obviously, if a country is trying to invade and take territory, they're going to want to do so at the lowest possible cost. Now, there are examples we can think of about ways in which conflicts have been limited in the past. Um, in the Cold War, there are examples of proxy wars in which the US and the Soviet Union were able to clamp down on the level of violence by fighting through proxies. You can also imagine future conflicts in which we would try to limit the region in which the fighting has occurred or the types of weapons that are used within that conflict. The obvious example here is that the United States hopes that in these scenarios that I described, whether it's a scenario <laughs> involving Russia, China, or North Korea, the United States hopes and indeed plans to be able to fight and win those conflicts, to defend the territorial integrity of its allies, to uphold the credibility of the US alliance system, while still persuading the adversary not to cross the nuclear threshold and use nuclear weapons. So that limitation that is one of the core things that the United States hopes to extend to conflict, to make sure that we can achieve our outcomes that we want without the other side using nuclear weapons or without us having to use nuclear weapons. Now, will our adversaries make the same calculation? Do our adversaries also want there to be this very strict threshold between conventional and nuclear conflict? If we look at our, the range of potential adversaries that we're talking about here, whether it's Russia, China, or North Korea, there is evidence that it may be possible that in certain conflict scenarios that they may have an opposite um, conclusion. They may think that crossing the nuclear threshold is a better way for them to achieve their outcomes that they want while still limiting escalation to a level of a large scale nuclear exchange. So the ways that we can look in to try to figure out what our adversaries are gonna do, we can look at their doctrine, we can look at their force posture, we can look at their training and exercises. 
So with all of these different countries, there's mixed evidence and I think robust debate about how you would interpret those evidence. Russia has, is the potential adversary that is best positioned to execute a strategy of limited nuclear escalation because of the large diversity of their capabilities and their ability to have both a number of regional nuclear capabilities as well as their, their robust um, strategic nuclear deterrent. China's nuclear doctrine is obviously far more re restrained than Russia's, but it is developing improved regional nuclear strike capabilities that may cause it to reconsider whether or not some of these options might be useful in the future. China is also in their military writing. There is some question about whether or not in a crisis or a conflict they may start to reinterpret um, their no first use doctrine. And then with North Korea, North Korea is by far, I think, at least in the, in the past few years, has been the most aggressive in terms of issuing nuclear threats, but at least thus far and right now, they lack the capability to be kind of as robust in terms of threatening limited nuclear escalation in the same way that Russia d does. Now, I won't get into, there's, there's going to be a lot of debate and we can open that up for questions about how you would determine or how you would judge the evidence in all these different questions. But in addition to looking at their doctrine, training and exercises and force posture, the other thing that we have to look to when we're thinking about future nuclear deterrent scenarios, is particularly in conflict, is situation specific incentives. And by that I mean what is the adversary leader and the adversary, what are the incentives that they're going to face in no joke conflict scenarios? Because in reality, we don't know what exactly, what decisions that adversary leaders are going to make. What we do know is we can think through some of the scenarios that are going to arise and think through the incentives that they would have either to choose a de-escalatory path or to choose nuclear escalation. And thinking about those incentives will help us to think about another factor and in fact a most important factor that we can think about in terms of the likelihood of them using nuclear weapons, but also about shaping those incentives to make it so that deterrence of limited nuclear war is more viable from the United States perspective. So then I'll, I'll focus here on what, are, what would those adversary calculations be at the nuclear brink? If they're in the midst of a conflict, the conflict is escalating, whether or not it's a Russia, China, or North Korea scenario that I described, how, what calculations in a big structural sense would the adversary be making? Now, of course, before crossing the nuclear threshold, the adversary's political and military decision makers, they would weigh costs and benefits according to their own biases, according to imperfect decision making mechanisms, and with incomplete and potentially incorrect information. But at the same time, they would still be weighing costs and benefits about choosing one path versus the other. And these are the types of the things that I think would weigh on their decision making. The first, the relative attractiveness of the alternative path. This is a conflict that is, at, that is pro, pro, proceeding in a way, and how does the adversary think that their position is? Do they think that they're in a strong position where the conflict is going to go well for them and they're going to get the outcome they want? Do they think that they're going to be able to successfully invade and conquer this country? Or is it a conflict in which they think that they're in a weak position, where the U.S. and its allies have, have a stronger response than they expected, their political will is high, maybe the U.S. Ha and its allies have more military capability than they were expected so that they're worried about it. Now, in the strong position, it's still possible that an adversary would choose nuclear, a nuclear option if they thought that doing so would secure a faster or more complete victory and that they thought that that risk was worth it. But in a weak position, the adversary incentive to potentially use a nuclear option would be even higher. If an adversary fears that their conventional campaign would cause them, uh, that is going to fail, and that failure would have a huge political consequence for them at home, then their incentive to conduct a nuclear escalation option is much stronger. The second factor is the potential benefits of nuclear escalation. I think we can think about the, the ways that adversaries would think about nuclear escalation benefits in two different ways. There are two different pathways or, or mechanisms to coercion. Now, obviously, these are intertwined, but I think it's useful to conceptually distinguish them. The first is that they would conduct a limited nuclear strike to suggest the potential for yet further escalation. So if they've issued a nuclear threat and that nuclear threat wasn't believed or didn't cause the US and its allies to back down, then they may think that they have to go further and actually use a nuclear weapon to show that they're willing to do so. And by using a nuclear weapon, that would raise the risk on the, the side of both the US and its allies that more nuclear escalation is possible. And simply by suggesting that there might be more nuclear escalation, fear within those countries and their leaderships and the populations might cause them to think about accommodation. The second mechanism, coercive mechanism, would be to use nuclear weapons to actually achieve 
an instrumental effect in the conflict to improve their military position. So if an adversary, for example, were able to use nuclear weapons to degrade the American and allied ability to command and control their theater forces, to flow surge forces to the battlefield, or to protect air and naval power in a conflict area, the cost for the US and its allies to restoring the status quo ante would significantly increase. So by employing nuclear weapons in that instrumental way, they will have made it much more difficult and therefore more costly for the US to overturn the gains that they have made. And in that scenario, in that case, the, they might think that the US and its allies might, might not think that those costs are worth the benefit of getting back to the status quo ante. So they could think that they have a pathway in which they could achieve a beneficial outcome. Now, obviously, in the, in the US perspective, we generally think that there's a very narrow circumstances in which nuclear weapons would have a lot of utility compared to conventional alternatives. But our adversaries might not have that same conclusion, and they may think about instrumental effects of nuclear weapons more broadly than we do, particularly if you're not thinking about before a conflict, but if you're thinking about in a conflict that's escalated for a while and that conventional forces have deteriorated. So you can imagine the potential instrumental utility that adversaries could imagine as holding at risk hard and deeply buried targets, compensating for inaccuracy of weapons or lack of specific targeting information, or to ma make up for lack of available conventional firepower, whether it's because it's degraded or because it's not available at the time and place that they need to, in order to achieve these campaign outcomes that they're looking for. Now the last calculation, the likely cost and risk of crossing the nuclear threshold. Obviously, the adversary in employing nuclear weapons would be thinking, what, is the US, what are the US and its allies going to do in response? So with the cost of the US response, they would think, what is the likely US reaction? How costly would the US response be to us? And would the US response arrest our advantage in military advantage in this conflict, or would it not have that large of an effect? The risk of escalation. Obviously, in opening, crossing the nuclear threshold and making it so that there's a potential for nuclear escalation, the adversary would be very worried about the potential that escalation would spiral. Is the adversary confident that they can keep a cap on nuclear escalation, or are they worried that it may go even farther? And obviously, that will be connected to what they think the likely U.S. response would be. And then finally, the political fallout. How are the U.S. allied and public likely to react? Is this going to cause a rally around a flag effect in those countries, or is this going to cause fear to make them think that they don't want to continue fighting? How would the adversary's domestic audience react? Is its own population going to potentially turn against the leadership because of nuclear employment? Or similarly, will they be united behind the employment? And finally, how would the international community respond to this violation of norms and the, the use of nuclear weapons? If the, if the adversary perceived that the international community would unite behind the US and its allies, then perhaps they would think that the benefits of nuclear escalation, even a slightly more favorable negotiated outcome, would not be worth the cost in terms of what they would get in the post-war arrangement. So if you think about those type of calculations, and those are the calculations that the adversary would be going through, what are the ways that an adversary would actually think about employing nuclear weapons for if, while favorably managing escalation in a limited war? Again, I think there are two conceptual ways that an adversary might, might do this. The first is that they could threaten uncontrollable nuclear escalation. And in essence, this would be an adversary strategy of saying, here's one nuclear use, and if you respond in some way that we don't like or respond aggressively with nuclear force, we will use all of the rest of our nuclear capability against you. So the obvious advantage of this is that it raises a specter of extremely high cost. If a country like North Korea, for example, said that if you, use, if you respond to our single use of nuclear weapons with any nuclear response that we will use all of the rest of our capability against South Korea, <coughs> Japan, and the United States, the, the potential cost there is very high. The problem is that the credibility of that may be in doubt. Would the adversary really follow through on that threat? And there is a lot of reasons you can imagine why an adversary might worry about actually taking steps to make it so that this threat was credible. So an adversary to make this threat credible might do so by issuing a public declaratory statement. Even more so, they could potentially pre-delegate some of their nuclear forces to make it so that the risk of uncontrolled escalation is higher. The problem from an adversary perspective is that by taking those steps, it makes it so that the adversary leader has less control of their ability to manage escalation. So it's in essence, if the US and its allies started to probe their threat, if they actually do take the steps of aggressive pre-delegation, then they have less ability to manage and control escalation. 
And from the adversary's perspective, there's a lot of reasons that they might want to try to control and manage the escalation process because they know, it, particularly the smaller nuclear powers like North Korea, knows that an all-out war is really bad for them. So those leaders have a lot of incentive to try to still manage escalation to the extent possible, even if it's just to try to get an outcome like comfortable exile as opposed to having losing their life at the end of a conflict. So if that strategy is not viable, if threatening uncontrolled escalation is not viable, then the, the other potential path that they might go is limited nuclear war control. So the adversary under this conditions, the adversary would attempt to establish the conditions by which they could use nuclear weapons in a certain way and using certain criteria that would maximize the instrumental and suggestive value of crossing the nuclear threshold while minimizing the risk of retaliation, counter-escalation, and backlash. So again, when I talked earlier about in limited, in limited wars, both sides are essentially going to be tacitly bargaining over the level and the types of military violence that are being used. In this way, the adversary may attempt to establish a standard by which there are certain criteria for nuclear warfare that are inbounds and others that are out of bounds. In essence, trying to raise the threshold for the level of conflict above conventional nuclear, but to a limited nuclear level where they think they can achieve the kind of advantage that they want while deterring the US and its allies from going to a higher level where escalation would be potentially uncontrolled or where they would not be able to get their advantage. Now, these, what exactly these limitations that the adversaries would try to seek would be, they could be narrow, they could be broad, and it's possible that they could change over time. The adversary could start with a very narrow band and then expand to something a little more broad. Now, in terms of these nuclear war control strategies, these plausible adversary nuclear war control strategies, the re general requirements that I think the adversary would seek is that they would want something that has a net advantage to them. I think that's obvious. They would want to have a limitation that clearly distinguishes the type of nuclear use that they might pursue from other types of nuclear use. And they would also have to have a viable strategy for deterring US counter escalation. So they have to have a belief that here's the cap, below the cap will have an advantage, you clearly understand this line, and going up here is not in the US and allied interest. Those are the general type of criteria that an adversary would think about, about how they could effectively manage nuclear escalation in a way that would be favorable to their interests. There are two ways that I think, or plausible ways that an adversary might do this, and I think there are many more, but these are just two that I, I note in the monograph. The first is that an adversary might try to decouple theater and strategic nuclear war. So if an adversary could distinguish between nuclear use within the region of the conflict and large-scale war involving the United States homeland and their own homeland, then that might be a clear limitation that they could think that they would have an advantage. So if they had this instrumental advantage in the way that I described earlier, where they thought that nuclear use could prevent the United States from flowing forces to achieve the outcomes that it wanted, while also being able to control escalation, then they might think that it's an advantageous. So Russian military writings, for example, distinguish between regional war and strategic or global nuclear war, and Russia has capabilities that might allow it to draw that distinction. China and North Korea have been less explicit in drawing this distinction, but the capabilities that they are developing for nuclear strikes against US bases in the region in the Western Pacific give them potentially the ability to do so in a conflict. Third is that in addition, an adversary might also try to manipulate the rules of theater nuclear warfare, the rules. Again, this is a tacit bargaining process. So an adversary might, for example, attempt to exclude strategic delivery systems. If Russia, for example, in using or using certain capabilities, said that if the US responded with a theater or a strategic delivery system, that they, they would see that as an escalation to strategic nuclear war. That would be their attempt to manipulate the rules of what would happen in a theater nuclear war to their advantage. Now, an additional category of ways that adversaries might think about limiting or distinguishing between certain nuclear strikes and others is distinguishing between the types of nuclear strikes. And one way that I think an adversary might do this is if they were to distinguish between strikes that were consistent with the law of armed conflict traditions and strikes that are far less discriminating. Now, there are a lot of ways in which an adversary could potentially, and I, I say potentially because it, a lot of it would just depend on the circumstances, attempt to use nuclear weapons in a way that would result in a low number of non-combatant casualties. So some of those examples could be a detonation of nuclear weapons in outer space, uh, 
the use of a nuclear weapon for an EMP effect, the use of nuclear weapons at sea, or a strike of a, with nuclear weapons that are low yield against a relatively isolated military target. Now within these concepts of nuclear use, the adversary would say, we have used nuclear weapons in a ways that are conditioned with some of these norms about limiting non-combatant casualties, and that any response in, of, of, you, any response in, which, the aver, in which the United States and its allies use nuclear weapons in a way that was less discriminating would be out of bounds. So it would be essentially trying to draw a line between discriminate and non-discriminate use of nuclear weapons. The advantage from the adversary perspective is that they might reduce backlash in terms of both how their own population, the US population, and the international community would perceive it. And they would also potentially limit the type of options that the United States has for in-kind response. If the US also had felt that this distinction was important and didn't want to respond in a more discriminating way, then it might be in a dilemma where it didn't know exactly what uh, type of response would be possible. Now, it's possible also that, again, adversaries could have an even stricter limitation. For example, in terms of distinguishing types of nuclear strikes, they might distinguish between nuclear war at sea versus on land. And this is something that, that the Soviets uh, seem to, to think about during the Cold War, and which Russia today still seems to have some ideas for it. The 2017 Russian Naval Doctrine shows some evidence that Russia still ma maintains this idea about distinguishing between, between nuclear war at sea and nuclear war on land. So if, this is, if those are the, the types of risks that, that I think we're thinking about, again, from a conceptual perspective, and we would have to think about it a lot more specifically about each individual adversary, what does that mean for the US? What does that mean for how we and our allies can attempt to strengthen deterrence? So again, these are, these are concepts that I think need to, be, need to be applied specifically. But the first is that the way we should think about this problem, in my opinion, is in terms of nuclear use stability during a conflict. And what I mean is that a condition of nuclear use stability would be a conventional conflict in which neither side has an incentive to conduct nuclear strikes. And that would be defined as, in the scenario, if you can, you can imagine the incentives that I talked about as existing along a spectrum. So stability is we want to make it so that the stronger the adversary incentive to potentially use nuclear weapons, they're still not going to because of these other factors that are in play. So if in a condition of nuclear use stability, both combatants believe they have an acceptable outcome even if they don't use nuclear weapons. And second, neither combatant thinks that they will gain a very large advantage by employing nuclear weapons. So in the most unstable situation by that definition, uh, one of the countries is willing to accept, they are both, they are unwilling to accept the settlement offer that the other side is proposing, and they are confident that they can coerce a better offer by conducting limited nuclear strikes. So if you imagine the most unstable scenario, for example, a country like North Korea is certain that the, what the US and ally current intent is regime change. They think that we have a total, a total goal in that sense, and they are very confident that if they use nuclear weapons, then we will back down. That is a very unstable scenario from a nuclear use stability perspective because both the outcome is very bad from their perspective and the potential benefit of nuclear employment are very high. So we want to change those structural conditions such that that, is, that situation arise is in the fewest possible circumstances possible during conflict. So three ways we can do this. One is to present an acceptable alternative to crossing the nuclear threshold. This it would include um, not pursuing regime change as long as an adversary it, it does not cross the nuclear threshold. That's a, a, a very basic uh, requirement. But more generally, I think that the US and its allies need to consider that the less favorable the outcome that we attempt to force upon an adversary, the greater their incentive to try to employ nuclear weapons. So for example, if one of these limited conflicts occurs and the US starts to have an objective that goes beyond merely restoring the status quo ante and wants to impose some additional costs on an adversary, by insisting on that additional cost, we increase the incentive for the adversary to employ nuclear weapons. So we have to think about the costs and benefits of that in, in that way. And the, the second component of that is obviously that the offer that we're making, the limited offer that we're making, has to be credible. If the adversary thinks that the way we're fighting the war or doesn't believe that we are actually willing to accept a limited settlement offer, then they are going to be more likely to think that nuclear employment is an attractive option. Second, we can reduce the benefits of nuclear escalation. We can make it so that the adversary's concepts in terms of both their coerce, the, the coercive benefit in terms of the suggestive and instrumental value of nuclear weapons are lower. So the 
main way we can do this is to make it clear to the adversary that our stakes in any conflict will be higher if they employ nuclear weapons. If the adversary is convinced that their employment of nuclear weapons will increase U.S. resolve and make it so that we have a categorically higher stake in the conflict and therefore be willing to take on more pain to continue fighting, then they will worry or think perhaps that nuclear escalation is less attractive as an alternative. But second, we also need to counter the instrumental benefit that they might have from nuclear weapons. Now, obviously, an adversary is going to be more attracted to nuclear escalation if they think that it's going to change the campaign in a way that, they, that is favorable to them. So if the U.S. is able, along with our allies, to develop concepts of operation that are not vulnerable to nuclear strikes, if we're able to demonstrate our ability to conduct conventional operations even in a nuclear environment, and if we have air missile defenses and other passive defenses that make it more difficult for the adversary to actually conduct effective nuclear strikes, that combination will make the adversary less confident that their nuclear escalation option is something that's going to get them the operational effect that they want. And therefore, we will deter by making it so that that is less attractive. The last, increasing the likely cost of retaliation and the risk of nuclear escalation. I think this is, this is the obvious one. They will, have, they will be worried about how the U.S. and its allies were going to respond. One of the ways that we can do this is we can threaten significant non-nuclear retaliation. From a deterrence perspective, though, the only way that threats of non-nuclear retaliation can deter is if there is something that the U.S. is withholding in terms of a type of conventional operation or capability that it will only start using if the adversary crosses the nuclear threshold. You can imagine some of what those conceptually might be, but the problem is, will the U.S. really have that luxury in some of these conflict scenarios? Are there really conventional capabilities or concepts that we're going to hold at bay in order to threaten to prevent the adversary from deterring nuclear use? The second thing we can threaten is that we can threaten to expand war aims. And I think the most recent nuclear posture review showed an example of this with regard to North Korea. It said that if North Korea employs nuclear weapons, then the U.S. will pursue regime change. So that is a clear threat that implicitly, if North Korea does not employ nuclear weapons, that the U.S. might consider more limited war aims. But once they've crossed that threshold, our war aims expand. So again, from the adversary perspective, if they think our aims are limited but then would expand, then the potential cost for them of employing nuclear weapons and crossing this threshold are higher. And then the last is obviously to threaten nuclear retaliation. And I'll get into that in a little more specifically. With threatening nuclear retaliation, again, I, I think there are three ways or, or three types of ways that the U.S. can think about threatening nuclear retaliation or threatening nuclear escalation to persuade the adversary that their concept for limited nuclear war is not going to be effective. Now, again, the point of these strategies would be to counter potential adversary concepts for effectively controlling limited nuclear war. So they're e to try to demonstrate to the adversaries that even if they try to pursue a limited nuclear war path, it's not going to be effective. And again, that would be designed to persuade them to not pursuing it in the first place. The first way the, the US can do this is by, in short, blurring the lines, by increasing the risk of escalation beyond the adversary's preferred concept. So imagine some of these types of concepts that I talked about where adversaries might try to limit the escalation of conflict. If they try to draw a distinction, for example, between theater and strategic nuclear use, one strategy that the U.S. could pursue would be to make it so that that distinction is hard to maintain, to blur the distinction between theater and nuclear. One example of this, I think, is in the way that uh, Secretary Mattis has talked about uh, the use of any tactical nuclear weapons, saying that a tactical use of nuclear weapons would be a strategic game changer. And again, this is not, this is consistent with a lot of the ways that the US has talked in declaratory policy in the past. Essentially, trying to signal to the adversary that the distinction that they might try to draw between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons is not something that we might respect. So therefore, this limitation, they might be less confident that they can actually maintain this limitation that they want. Another example, I think, is you could see in the, in the Cold War, uh, with the, the placement of intermediate range nuclear forces within Europe. Part of the argument, at least made by some, about the benefit of those forces of, from the US perspective is that Russia would see, or in that case the Soviet Union, would see a seamless path between conventional war in Europe, um, theater, or, uh, theater or tactical nuclear warfare, and then strikes that could potentially hit the Soviet homeland. So by seeing that connection, they would be less confident that they could keep it into a theater uh, nuclear war and be more worried that theater would connect to strategic and therefore that they would not be able to control escalation. The benefits of this strategy, I think, are obvious. If the adversary is less confident in their ability to control escalation, then they're going to be less likely to pursue one of these limitations. The difficulty, though, is that 
it requires actually following through on the threat. And if the adversary doesn't believe that the U.S. and its allies will follow through on the threat, then it may not be credible. So, for example, to use the Cold War example, if the Soviet Union didn't think that we would actually employ intermediate-range nuclear forces deep within Soviet territory, then that threat would not be credible. And similarly today, if we issue these threats saying that a tactical nuclear use would result in a strategic response, if they don't believe that we would actually take that risk, then it's not, not credible. Second way that, that we could um, deter adversary limited nuclear escalation is by to threaten deliberate controlled counter escalation. So in essence, what the U.S. would do in this, in this scenario would be to threaten to raise the level of nuclear warfare to a level where the U.S. would have an advantage and the U.S. could still deter counter escalation. I think the easiest example to think about what this conceptually is, if Russia, for example, tried to say our, our tacit rules that we want to play by is that nuclear use at sea is acceptable, the United States could say, no, if you try to keep a nuclear use to sea, we will escalate and make it so that theater nuclear warfare is in play against both at sea and land-based targets. And again, this has a lot of parallels to the way that the U.S. and the Soviet Union acted uh, during the Cold War. In essence, by threatening to escalate to a higher but still controlled level of counter-escalation, it makes it so that the adversary, in this case Russia or previously the Soviet Union, does not think that that concept for escalation would potentially be attractive. The benefits, I think, again, are that this provides a viable means of using, getting to a level of nuclear escalation where the U.S. might have an advantage, so therefore the adversary might be less attracted to pursue this path. The cost, though, I think, obviously, is that by threatening to raise it to a higher level of nuclear warfare, if that threat is actually called out by the adversary, then the, the cost of, of fighting a theater nuclear warfare are obviously very high. And secondly, I think the other potential cost of this type of strategy is that by it implicitly, by threatening the adversary to say that if you use nuclear weapons in this way, we have a higher level of controlled counter escalation, implicitly that tells the adversary that we are thinking about kind of control of nuclear conflict. And so that might give more credence to their ideas that, that nuclear war can be limited in a way. So that's, again, a balance that, that has to be played. And then the last way, I think, conceptually to deal with this is to counter the adversary's perceived capability advantage. So the first one is blurring the lines. The second one is you have this distinction. We have an ability to have an advantage at higher. This is we recognize that this distinction that you might be make, it may, make between types of nuclear warfare is somewhat viable, and we are going to pursue capabilities or use arms control to try to limit the, the advantage that you have under this preferred level of nuclear warfare that you have. So again, if the adversary's concept is theater nuclear warfare, or if the adversary's concept is nuclear war at sea, or if the adversary's concept is discriminate <coughs> nuclear warfare in which they limit the number of noncombatant casualties, this strategy would be to pursue capabilities that make it so that the adversary does not perceive that they have an advantage under that condition or those potential conditions of limited nuclear warfare. The downsides of this are obvious in that if we pursue additional capabilities, the adversaries may pursue capabilities in response. There are also concerns about how our pursuit of nuclear capabilities would trade off with conventional capabilities, and there might be objections that could come from adversaries. So I think if you think about some of those potential upsides and downsides, the Cape, the U.S. will be most likely to pursue this type of strategy when new capabilities significantly enhance the U.S. deterrent posture in a way that is difficult for the adversary to offset, where there is a limited opportunity cost for U.S. conventional deterrence, and where the U.S. and its allies are in agreement about both the, the necessity of pursuing these, these type of capabilities. So finally, uh, in conclusion, before I, I pass it over to Brad, the goal from the U.S. perspective, is to counter adversaries' belief that limited nuclear warfare is something that may be in their interest in an escalating conventional conflict. If we really achieve this goal, if we do really well, our adversaries won't even be contemplating or planning for limited nuclear warfare. They won't be investing in, in limited nuclear warfare capabilities. They won't be conducting training and exercises designed to use nuclear weapons in a limited way. And they won't be issuing public statements and strategy documents in which they contemplate employing nuclear weapons in order to favorably manage escalation. Now, that may be something that is, is, is a bridge too far and not something that we can actually get to. But we will have partial success 
If we fail to dissuade adversaries from pursuing these type of capabilities, but we nonetheless deter them from actually employing those concepts in an actual conflict by making it so that even though they've contemplated, thought, and planned for those concepts, that they don't actually carry them out in a, in a real conflict scenario. And then one last closing thought before I pass it over to Brad. So the, the, again, as I said at the beginning, the concepts presented here are intended to be a starting point to conceptually think about the ways that the adversaries might think about controlling nuclear escalation and the ways in which the US, therefore, the types of different strategies conceptually that we might think about in terms of response. In order to actually implement those, those conceptual arguments or those conceptual concepts have to be tailored and applied to individual adversaries. And we have to think about specific adversaries and scenarios. We have to vigorously develop different strategies tailored to each potential adversary. And we have to acquire whatever capabilities are needed in order to execute those strategies. And all the while, there has to be a continuous evaluation both of what potential concepts for limited nuclear warfare that our adversaries might find attractive, and based off of those concepts, what types of capabilities, strategy, doctrine the US needs in each of these theaters of, of potential warfare. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John.